This presentation is called, You Are Built to Learn, uh, But What and How? So there's lots of reasons, as we're going to see, to think that you were built to learn. And in marketing, they say that if you tell somebody something six times, they'll believe it. So let's do this one more time. You are built to learn. You are built to learn. You are built to learn. And our questions are, again, built to learn what and how, and what makes us think that we're built to learn? Well, there's a couple reasons to believe this. And one has to do with your big brain. So your big brain is both risky and expensive. And why would we have that big brain, which seems to have a lot to do with learning, um, if there weren't some learning benefit associated with it? And secondly, your whole pattern of development seems to accommodate your brain. So there seems to be a connection between brain development and the overall development patterns of our body, our life history. And there's a good argument that human life history in some ways has uh, evolved, uh, driven by brain evolution. So a question to ask here at the start is, is bigger better? Um, does size matter when it comes to brains? And for comparisons of modern humans, the answer is not very much. Intraspecific variation in brain size is less than variation in body size. But if you have a bigger body, your brain will likely be bigger in absolute terms than someone with a smaller body. And on those uh, measures, men are generally larger than women. So in absolute terms, male brains are on average larger. However, uh, smaller bodies have bigger brains relative to weight. And if we take that approach, and in terms of encephalization indexes, uh, we'll find that uh, female brains are in relative terms larger than males. So we could batter this back and forth as much as we want, and it's really not going to uh, help us a great deal. But in evolutionary terms, uh, human brain size is quite interesting. Uh, let's hope that size matters because having a big brain is a risky enterprise. And I couldn't find the source of this quote. It's probably not exactly correct then, but the quote basically goes, we should not have one ounce more of brain tissue than is necessary for our survival. And that's because there's many risks associated with big brains, and we're going to underline four of those risks. So the first risk is that your big brain is an energy hog. So in the average adult human, uh, brain tissue is just 2% of body mass, but consumes 20% of resting energy. And that, by definition, is expensive tissue. It's tissue in our body that takes more than its share of our energy. When we turn and look at uh, small uh, humans that are just developing, uh, they can, of course, barely hold those big heads up. So for human infants, about 60% or more of resting energy is consumed by the brain. That's really quite remarkable. So when we look at uh, the expensive tissue in humans and compare what we observe to what would be expected for a primate of our size, this is quite remarkable, the result. This is a study by Leslie Aiello, and it's one of the most cited scientific papers uh, produced in anthropology in the last couple decades. It's called the Expensive Tissue Hypothesis. It appears it doesn't hold generally across mammals, but it seems to make sense in terms of humans relative to primates. So if we look at uh, the expected size of our brains, given our size, a primate of our size should have a brain that's about 450 grams. But on average, human brains are about 1,300 grams. Now, what's interesting here is that our brains are bigger than expected, but our guts are smaller than expected. So the human gut is just about 1,100 grams, smaller than our brain. Whereas for a primate of our size, we should have a really quite massive gut of 1,900 grams. So it appears there's been a trade-off. Our digestive system is smaller than expected. Our brain is bigger than expected. 
So when you see these shirts that say no guts, no glory, uh, that's obviously doesn't fit human. Not quite gutless, but we're as close as you can get among primates. Now, modern humans also have small teeth. And uh, this seems to be an evolutionary trend. You look at early uh, ancestral humans and they have quite large teeth, some of them. We also have quite weak jaws. So this is kind of, I'm playing the uh, highest uh, corner of this. This is what used to be called a robust Australopithecine, is now sometimes called Paranthropus. Um, probably they're not our ancestors, but rather a line of uh, bipedal apes that went extinct. Um, but they have uh, some really massive jaw muscles, and they attach up top there that uh, bony uh, ridge along the top that's called a sagittal crest and that's where their massive jaw muscles attached and then look at the size of those molars they had molars three or four times bigger than us um, they were real chewers so how did we manage this how did uh, we uh, get these big brains and small teeth and weak jaws right and how do we manage to feed these big energy intensive brains given our small mouths and our short guts. It doesn't seem to quite make sense. One hypothesis on this and a popular work on it by an anthropologist at Harvard named Richard Rangham is called Catching Fire, How Cooking Made Us Human. He's not the only one to pursue this, uh, the cooking hypothesis. But the argument is that fire uh, pre-digests our food, it breaks it down and starts the digestive process outside of our bodies. And so does the other aspects of meal preparation, including cutting up and grinding and mashing food, which is something humans do a great deal, and particularly in the sexual division of labor females. So we seem to be looking not simply at women the gatherer as uh, being a really reliable source of food in many uh, latitudes, but also woman the cook. And it may be more reasonable to think of men attaching themselves to women, uh, inverting uh, the man the hunter proposal that women attach themselves to a man that provides. It could very well be that men attach themselves to women um, who provide a steady, reliable diet. So a second risk of our big brains is that they're hot. And we have a narrow temperature tolerance, and of the organs in our body, our brain is the most temperature sensitive. So not everybody uh, has an equilibrium at 98.6, but that's the, an average for humans. And keeping a cool head is quite difficult. And there's proposals then that relate this quite compellingly uh, to human hairlessness. Humans have different kinds of sweat glands than other primates, and they allow us to, to, to uh, get rid of the heat in our body very efficiently. And, of course, uh, being hairless means we're exposed to ultraviolet radiation, which explains our striking variation in melanin content and skin hues. So this is an interesting connection. A third risk of our brains is uh, having big brain babies. Uh, maternal death and childbirth was a real risk, so the risks are dramatically reduced in uh, modern uh, medical environments. Uh, one estimate I found was that 1 in 16 women um, died of maternal death and childbirth in traditional societies. That seems maybe a little low. Um, but a partial solution to this, of course, is extensive postnatal development. So despite the fact that human babies are born with these big heads, they get a lot bigger once they're out of the womb. And indeed, this is a key difference then between humans and chimps. Uh, human brains expand 300% after we're born, whereas chimp brains expand about a third. So the difference in size isn't nearly as striking at birth as it is by the time we're about age 12. Now the result of this is a very long dependency period, so the dependency period keeps getting longer, and this is the time needed to mature outside the womb, ex utero, and that time increases. And uh, this uh, chart shows that as being 12 years. I think maybe that's a little shy of what's realistic. Now new risks follow. 
Um, the fourth risk here is that offspring are vulnerable for a long time, giving this long dependency period. And so this is a risky strategy to follow. And an associated cost of this is very high parental investment over a long period of time. And as we've seen, there's two proposals to account for this high parental investment that mothers need help. One of these is Sarah Hurdy's uh, proposal of alloparental matrilines that the mother has her, her mother and her sisters and close relations um, in the foraging band helping her out. And the more traditional one was pair bonding and sexual division of labor. I see no reason not to expect that both of these might be important, uh, that they don't displace one another, but they come together in varied combinations. So what's the benefit, right? We've got these big risky brains in our head. What's the benefit of them? And it would seem to be learning, um, but this is where the question arises, what do we learn and how? So there's basically two views of learning. That's probably too simple if you're a psychologist, but it'll work for us. Uh, what we have call cultural psychology that represents in some ways a more traditional view, and then evolutionary psychology. And the view of cultural psychology is that basically we learn arbitrary symbolic meanings that are exemplified by language. We acquire bodies of cultural knowledge that are symbolic. And uh, it's been stressed by many cultural anthropologists that these systems of symbolic meanings that shape our behavior are only accidentally adaptive. And that's a stress on the arbitrariness. Evolutionary psychologists then argue that our brains target very specific kinds of information that's, that solve problems of adaptation for us and that they're funded mentally adaptive, at least in that past environment of evolutionary adaptation. Now, more recently, the cultural approach has also uh, tackled adaptation. So we have now two views of adaptive benefits. Um, the cultural view stressing what's called connectionism, and of course, evolutionary psychologists stressing the modularity view. And one way that connectionism has been developed is in terms of complexity theory, arguing though that symbols allow us a highly flexible response to our environment, or what's called plasticity. And this means bendable, shapeable, moldable. On the other hand, the key metaphor for the evolutionary psychology approach is the Swiss Army knife. And here the argument is that modularity allows durable and consistent behaviors and retaining what works. However, we have talked about facultative responses and everybody recognizes that. And again, here too, I think there's probably some truth to both sides. Well, that's all. Thanks for listening.